Good evening and welcome to episode 89 of Mystery, Murder, and Mayhem. And I'm slowly starting to get over this crud that me and Nick have had. Um, and I still got this stupid sore throat and a cough that won't go away. So y'all just bear with me. But um, anyway, moving on to tonight's episode. On this day, December 19th, back in 1979, a high school senior named Michelle Martinko was found brutally murdered in her family's car. This case went unsolved for 39 years before the killer was finally brought to justice. So on tonight's episode, we have this beautiful young woman. Her name was Michelle Martinko, and she was born in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, on October 6, 1961, to her mom, Janet, and her dad, Albert. She was one of two daughters that the couple had, and she was quite a talented young lady. She performed in her choir at, at Kennedy High School, and she was a member of the twirling squad. She always dressed in the most fashionable clothes. And I imagine she probably turned a lot of heads. She was just very beautiful. Well, on the night of December 19th, she attended a banquet for her choir. And when it was over, she drove to the mall. And it was this brand new mall that had opened recently. But she had drove over there to pick up a new winter coat that her mom had put on layaway for, and maybe she was gonna do a little Christmas shopping because you know, Christmas was just right around the corner. Well, while she was there, she ran into her friend, Kurt Thomas. He worked there at the mall at a men's clothing store. And they walked through the mall for a little while together. They were talking, laughing, and then they parted ways at the mall exit. Kurt, he would be the last person to see Michelle alive. Now, it just wasn't like Michelle at all to not come home or come home later than was planned. So when she didn't show up, her parents knew something was wrong. And at 2 a.m., Albert, her dad, he called the police and reported her missing. Well, the next time anyone would see Michelle would be around 4 a.m. Police officers found Michelle in the car with over 20 stab wounds to her chest, neck, arms, and face. And she also had defensive wounds to her hands. Who on earth could just have done something so horrendous to such a beautiful young woman with a bright future ahead of her? And I should mention, too, that the car was still in the parking lot at the mall. She had never even left the parking lot. Now, police quickly ruled out robbery as a motive because she still had the $180 on her that she had entered the mall with. And so then they had to begin thinking, you know, what could be the motive and who could have done this? Well, immediately her family thought that an ex-boyfriend, Andy Seidel, was a possible suspect because for one thing, they had just recently broken up and their breakup had been a very ugly one. And another thing, there just wasn't any other suspects. According to Michelle's family, after Michelle and Andy had broken up, he kind of had that attitude of, I can't have her, no one else can. He was still possessive over her. He wanted to know where she was, who she was with, what they were doing. Um... And then it came about that they found out during the early part of the investigation that Michelle had actually met with Andy at the mall that night. But there was just no evidence to tie him to murdering Michelle. So he was never arrested and he was never charged. And then Kurt Thomas, that friend that she had ran into in the mall, he came under suspicion by the police. 
And before he had even been told that Michelle had been murdered, he was taken in for questioning. But again, there were no witnesses, no surveillance footage. They weren't doing DNA like they do now. So they just had no way to know if Andy or Kurt or anybody else for that matter was a suspect. And just like that, like so many of the the episodes that we talk about, um, or cases that we talk about on these episodes, the case went cold. And it went cold for nearly four decades. Her parents, Janet and Albert, they went to their graves not knowing who had killed their daughter. Well, fortunately, over those years, the technology of solving crimes advanced. DNA was something that became a key element in solving murders and other types of crimes. And sitting in storage on a shelf was a box that contained the dress that Michelle had been wearing the night that she had been murdered. And in 2006, investigators pulled that dress out of the evidence box and they found that there was some DNA on that dress. So at this point, the testing begins, and soon they would know if it had actually been Michelle's friend, Kurt, or her ex-boyfriend, Andy, who had taken her life all those years ago. The first person they asked for a DNA sample from, for comparison, was Andy, but it wasn't a match. Now, I'm sure that even though he knew he was not guilty, The weight of that burden was lifted off of him. Now, can you imagine going nearly 40 years with people suspecting you of murdering somebody? I mean, you know, it's not a tiny town, but you know, in any town, there's going to be speculation and rumors and all types of things. You know, how people talk when something happens. And I'm sure it was going on there, too. Well... When that, his DNA wasn't a match, they turned to Kurt. But y'all, he refused to submit a sample. And because of that, the detective that was working on that case back then, he just knew he had his killer. Well, after a little bit of bargaining, Kurt's lawyer finally backed down and Kurt submitted his DNA. And he wasn't a match either. As a matter of fact, No one that they tested was a match, and they had ran the results through CODIS without a hit, and they had even tested Michelle's brother-in-law, but one by one, all of these people were ruled out. So now the police had to find out just who this stranger was that had killed Michelle, and I'm pretty sure that was probably like finding a needle in a haystack. In 2015, a new detective takes over the case. His name was Matt Denlinger, and he was given that cold case, and he was determined to find out just who that stranger was. But his biggest obstacle was knowing just where to even start with the DNA evidence. But y'all, it was his wife who gave him an idea. That year, she had gotten an Ancestry.com DNA kit for Christmas, and she suggested that maybe he could try something like that. Now, he didn't exactly go through Ancestry to find answers, but it did put him in the right direction of where to start. So, Denlinger, he found this company named Parabon Nano Labs, and they're located in Virginia. And... They used the DNA found on Michelle's dress to create an image of what the killer might look like. They even had it nailed down to his eye color, hair color, skin color, and facial structure. And I think that's pretty freaking cool to take DNA and and come up with that. So now it's 2017. And they have a possible image of what that killer might look like. So they start circulating it, like, through all the media. But soon, Denlinger hit another dead end because people were calling in with, you know, who it could have been. But every single one of them said that it looked like someone different. There wasn't, like, two calls that matched the same person. So, you know, that was another kind of dead end. 
Well, then we're going to fast forward to the spring of 2018, and that's when the Golden State Killer was arrested. Police in that case had used DNA that they submitted through a genealogy database, and it eventually led to the arrest of Joseph D'Angelo. This gave Denlinger hope that he would soon be closing in on Michelle Matinko's killer. Now, the first hit on a match for the DNA came from a woman in Washington State, and from there, Denlinger and his team, they started building a family tree. Well, soon the evidence from that family tree led Denlinger to three brothers who were still living in Iowa. And those three brothers were Jerry Burns, Kenneth Burns, and Donald Burns. And they grew up in Manchester, Iowa, which is only about 45 minutes from Cedar Rapids. And two of those brothers actually still lived in Manchester. So finally, it seemed like there was a light at the end of that tunnel. Well, the weird thing is, is that none of these men, these brothers, they none of them had a criminal record. They were all business owners, and they just didn't seem like the usual suspects. Well, Detective Denlinger and his team, they went to Manchester to do a little quiet investigation. They didn't want to stir up too much attention. Now, what they were hoping to do was somehow collect DNA to see just which one of these three brothers was the true killer. They started watching Kenneth first. And one day, Kenneth went for lunch, and the investigators, they were able to take a drinking straw that Kenneth had used during that lunch. Well, that straw was sent to the state lab for testing, and the lab made this like a priority thing. But um, after comparing the two samples of DNA, Kenneth, he was ruled out as a suspect. Well, after Kenneth was ruled out, the investigation team, they went to Davenport, Iowa, where Donald was now living, and they waited outside of his home. And when the trash was rolled out to the curb for pickup, they were able to collect a glass and a toothbrush. Well, the DNA that was collected from it was not a match for the killer either. Well... That left Brother Jerry. So Denlinger and his associates went back to Manchester and watched Jerry leave his place of business. And from there, they followed him to a restaurant where he was taking a lunch break. And like they had done with Kenneth, they collected the drinking straw that he had used that day. Well, this straw, it was sent to the state lab. Another rush was put on the test and And when all this testing was done, investigators finally had a match. On December 19th, the anniversary of Michelle's murder, Denlinger and a retired investigator who had previously worked on the case drove back to Manchester and went to Jerry's business. Denlinger introduced himself, told him he was from Cedar Rapids, and he wanted to talk to him. When they showed Jerry a picture of Michelle, though, he did not ever see in her. Now, Jerry did submit a DNA sample. And after that DNA sample was taken, then Linger told him that he was positive that his DNA would be a match. Well, then Linger went on to tell Jerry that he had already had a sample of his DNA tested and it matched the DNA found out the scene. Well, Jerry was adamant that he had not been at the mall that night, and he didn't know how his DNA had gotten on Michelle's dress. But Denlinger wasn't buying it. And even though Jerry hadn't confessed during that interview, the decision was made to place him under arrest for the 1979 murder of Michelle Martinko. And I should note here also that he didn't confess and he didn't deny, so there's that. Now, you would think that once this case went to court, it would be pretty much cut and dry, but it wasn't. Burns' family had hired one of the top defense attorneys in Iowa, and the prosecutor in the case, Nick Maybanks, 
He told the story of the kind of person that Michelle had been as he presented his case against Jerry Burns. Former classmates of Michelle's testified to what kind of person she had been as well. And one of those persons was her former boyfriend, Andy Seidel. And he talked about how kind and pure she was, how she treated others. And can you just imagine how nerve-wracking that had to have been for Mr. Seidel? Because, I mean, he had been the target of suspicion for all those years. And then he had to get on the witness stand in front of Michelle's family and friends and talk about her. Also called to the witness stand was Kurt Thomas, who had also been under suspicion at one time. And he broke down in tears as he talked about the last time he saw her and her smile. And he said it was something that had affected him for all of his life. And then there was one more witness called on, and it was quite a surprise to Jerry Burns. It was his cellmate from the county jail, and that man's name was Michael Allison. Allison testified that Burns had told him that he felt he had basically gotten away with it and then went on to say that no matter the outcome of the trial, he had lived his life with his family for all those years. And y'all get this, and I just can't even wrap my head around this, but um, Burns even autographed a copy of a newspaper that had the front page story of Michelle Matinko's murder on it. Like he's some kind of celebrity. He autographed that paper and gave it to um, Michael Allison. It, it's just mind blowing. But um, so the defense on the other hand caught on only one witness and that witness was a forensic consultant. And that consultant told the court that it was possible that Burns' DNA had gotten on Michelle's dress via what is called the DNA transfer theory, which means that Burns could have been close to Michelle at some point the night that she was murdered and coughed or sneezed. And then he went on to say that it was entirely possible that that could have happened. So, like, what he was saying is that he was somewhere probably in the mall near her and he coughed or sneezed. And that DNA just happened to land on her dress. But y'all don't forget that DNA was also found on the gear shift in the car that Michelle had been driving. So, yeah. But y'all, the thing is, even though the prosecution had some pretty damning evidence against Jerry Burns, they didn't have a motive. And maybe that could possibly have created a big hole in their case. Or was there a mur- Or was there a motive? Now, it wasn't allowed as evidence in the trial, but they did a thorough check of Burns' computer, and it showed up searches for things like assault, rape, and murder. Or really, to be more specific, one of his searches was for blonde molested after getting strangled. And another search was for sex with freshly dead person. This man is really sick okay but like I said that wasn't allowed in court as evidence and that was because Burns's defense attorney fought to keep it out of court and in light of that the defense argued that there was no motive now both cases or both sides they presented their closing arguments and then the case was given to the jury to deliberate and those deliberations didn't take long at all after three hours The jury came back and had found Jerry Burns guilty of murder in the first degree. And there was a delay in his sentencing because of COVID, but when he was finally sentenced, he was given life without the possibility of parole. Iowa doesn't have, um, like, execution as as a sentence. But anyway... So he's doing his time in jail. But then in September of this year, he filed an appeal with the Iowa Supreme Court saying that investigators actually violated his constitutional rights when they took that straw that he had left in the restaurant. Now, at a hearing, his attorney argued that investigators needed a warrant to take that straw and said that the straw was still Jerry's property 
Even though he had left it on that table to be thrown away, it was still Jerry's property. Okay. But it looks like it's still in the appeal process. So as soon as that, there is more information on that, I'll have to give y'all an update. Well, y'all, that's all I have for tonight's episode. Now, be sure to come back on Wednesday at 3 in the afternoon for our last Christmas Rewind episode. And y'all, Wednesday is also the podcast's second birthday. These two years have, like, really flown by. And, of course, there's going to be a new What the Friday episode on Friday night. Um, Then on Christmas Eve at 8 p.m., I'll be replaying this year's most listened to episode. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to tell y'all. Um, I'm sure I'll think of it later. But anyway, y'all have a great week. If you're out doing that last minute shopping, y'all please be careful. There's a lot of crazy people on the roads, um, including myself. But anyway, y'all, um, y'all have a good night. <laughs>